Well, welcome everyone and good afternoon. I hope you've had a, a good time at, at DrupalCon so far. My name is Eric. I am a freelance web developer. I live in, in Brighton on the south coast of England. Uh, I've been involved with Drupal for um, probably about seven or eight years. Um, and I've been using it to build both traditional HTML websites, but also to manage content for native mobile apps. And I've spent a bit of time over the last few months uh, researching this issue of, of offline and um, how native apps handle it, how the web handles it, uh, and see if, if we can learn anything from, from those two sides. So I want to start by looking back to um, 2007 for a moment. Um, so I found a, a website from 2007 from uh, way back for DrupalCon in Barcelona. Um, don't suppose, was anyone there at that time? Um, I show you this because this kind of website we would have used um, from an office or from home on a, uh, on a fixed internet connection. And you were either online or you were, you were not, you were offline. But also in, in 2007, the, um, the first iPhone was released. And since we've used smartphones, we started to carry around the internet with us. We, you, know, you can have Wikipedia in your pocket. So we, we use the internet now in all sorts of different places. We use it outside. And, and we use it in conditions that are very different to where we used to. So we use it in an inherently hostile environment. We don't have the luxury of a, a fixed cable that we know is going to work. So when people started writing apps for phones, this kind of scenario was, was a given right from the start. People were aware of this, that there, there may not be a signal, there may not, you may not be able to get online. And we, d we designed apps to cope with this. And we can learn a lot from the way that's been done in about being resilient to, to network failures. There's an expectation with, with an app on my phone that uh, you know, when I press one of these icons, it will work, even if I'm if out and about. But sadly, we can't really say the same about the, the web. In reality, th this is kind of what we expect. And I see a lot of apps that have been built that, that um, I feel like they've been built purely to show the content that's on a website, but to cope with it offline. And this 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 conference, in fact, has has an app that people are using. It's um, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a very nice app. But I can't help but feel that when we do this, it's a big duplication of effort. We're writing a web front end, and we're then we're possibly writing an iOS and Android front end as well. And also, downloading an app can be um, can be quite onerous. Um, if you've got a slow connection and you need to download a 20, 30 megabyte app, or if you're roaming, it would be a lot easier if we could just use the website. So I'm going to look into this a little bit more detail because this is all the same hardware. It's also using the same network with its, all its frailties. And we're also downloading the same information. So the only thing that's really different is the software. And browsers are now starting to follow the lead taken by, by native apps in providing some functionality to, to handle this. And we'll, we'll look at that today. And I think that you know, going forward, a lot of apps that are in this kind of, that are here to, to provide offline, they might be start to become obsolete. Um, so I want to show you a little, a little demo site. This one is um, for a, a conference or a Drupal camp or something like that. We've got a, a, a home page, a schedule, and a few other pages. It's very basic. It's the most basic site you could have. No, no login, no forms, just, just a brochure site. It's a good candidate for seeing if we can improve it. Um, the question I want to ask is, is, is can we take this site and, and make it so that once, when someone visits it, you know, we can say they can go back to it later, even if they don't have Wi-Fi 
don't have a mobile signal? You know, can we provide something that a, a delegate could rely on? And how far away are we from being able to do that? So this is, this is the horizons track, and, and I'll say now that it, this, kind of, this stuff is quite new, quite raw. Um, there's limited browser support. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. But it's, it's very interesting to see where things are going. This service worker is a big key p part of the puzzle. And this is, this is a relatively new JavaScript API that we have. Um, it is essentially a client-side proxy. And it's a, it gives us a programmable layer between the document and the network. You can think of this as a little mini web server running on your phone. As for what it can do, it will intercept the network requests, like a, like a man in the middle type thing. It will it will handle everything that you re request from the network and everything that you get back. It also gives us a programmable cache um, and a couple of other things that are quite new, uh, push notifications and background sync where you can send and receive content even though your browser is, is, is closed. Those, those last two are... Um, a bit newer, a bit more, um, a bit, a bit less finished, and so I want to focus on the first two for now: the, the network and the caching. So if we fast forward to today and look at the state of things at the moment, the browser support. So as things stand, Chrome, Firefox, and Opera all support the stuff that we're going to show. This is been in development in Microsoft Edge uh, and it is not yet ready in Safari uh, and that actually includes the whole of iOS. Um, the other browsers on iOS are actually using um, WebKit and mobile Safari under the hood. So this, this website called Is Service Worker Ready? That is a good indicator of the state of play. There's a, there's a number of different things, a number of different components to this, and it lists them all. It tells you exactly what what is and isn't supported. But don't let this stop you. Don't think, oh, I can't possibly use this if it if it doesn't work in Safari. Or we can add the service worker to the website without. We can add it as progressive enhancement. It won't diminish the experience for anyone whose browser that doesn't support it they'll just get exactly what they had before. So what do we need to get started? First of all, we need to be running HTTPS. And secondly, we need to start adding a little bit, a little script to our code. So in, in our HTML file, we're going to register a service worker. So I'll put this in a, in a, in a condition which says if if the browser supports it then we'll then we'll start it if not just ignore it and we pass it the name of, of another script which will which we will use to tell the service worker what to do we'll come on to that in a moment and um, this scope parameter is quite interesting what that means is that any subsequent pay visits we make to pages within that scope will now be handled through the service worker. And also those pages will use the worker for all of their requests. Uh, so images, fonts, um, things used from CDNs, uh, Ajax, um, Google Analytics, everything will go through that worker. For now, we'll just leave the other script that configures the service worker empty. So by adding what we've seen, we have a, a, a worker up and running now. It doesn't really do anything, um, but it is there. And um, we can look at this demo site, and we can go into the, the browser's dev tools and see it running. 
uh, we can see all our service workers here and then we can go in and inspect it in the same way that we might inspect the document. So the, the service worker runs independently from the document window, so they don't know about each other. Uh, and it will stay there even if we close the browser. The service worker can, can go to sleep and then it will wake up when you come back online, uh, when you come back to the page. In order to customize it, we need to start thinking about the events. Service workers are event driven. And we can write JavaScript to run when the different events occur. There's quite a few events, but I want to focus on two today that are the most interesting for what we want to do. The first one is, a, is an install event. The very first time the service worker is run, this code runs. Typically in here, we'll download things that we need, that we always want available. CSS, uh, fonts, JavaScript, that sort of thing. The second one happens whenever a page makes a request. This is the, this is the fetch <coughs> event. And this one is where we do most of the work for, for handling offline. We can put pretty much whatever we want in here. We will get given a request and we need to pass back a response to this event and um, that's probably the most minimal example that will just return a fixed string but um, typically in here we would put some logic to say if it's a particular URL go and do one thing if it's a different URL do something else but it, it kind of shows you the, the structure of, of what we're dealing with but to make that more useful, I need to um, show you a couple of other things that, are, that, are, that we, we want to use. First thing I want to talk about is promises. So much of what we do here is, is asynchronous, uh, things that can take a long time to complete. And a lot of APIs will use these things called promises. Um, they could be widely used in the functional programming world, but they can be a little bit hard to get your head around at first. So what, what we're trying to do is ask a question that will take some time to answer. And we need to get back something in the meantime. We need to get back this promise that the question will be answered. The promise will either resolve uh, if it's successful, and if it does that, then the, the, the then block, the then function will be run. If it doesn't resolve, it will reject, and then we'll get this error handler working. Secondly, I want to talk about the, we get a new fetch API. This will look quite familiar if you've used uh, jQuery to, to do AJAX requests. Um, we're giving a request and asking the browser to fetch it, and then we're doing one of two things, if it comes back successfully or it doesn't. So we get a promise that, that of the answer to the fetch request. Lastly, I also want to mention a cache API. Um, it looks a bit like this. Um, this is quite different to the um, inbuilt browser cache. It sort of sits on top of it um, and allows you to access the inbuilt browser cache programmatically. But we can do things in here that we, we can't do with um, the e extra things that, that we can do, um, like putting, uh, getting stale content out. And we can sort of guarantee that if we put something in here, it will be there later on. And this, this idea of getting back stale content is uh, something that comes in uh, in handy later on. In the um, browser's dev tools, we can go in and inspect the cache and we can see what's in there. That's the demo site I showed you earlier. And we can see that it has, um, it has put all these, all these files in there.
So let's have a look at the site when it's offline. So I'm going to load it online first, the very first time, and now it will be downloading various pages and putting them in the cache. And now I'm going to put the phone into flight mode. <coughs> now when we go and view the page, it's there. And that's because we fetched, we put those pages in the cache first, then we got them out of the, pa out of the cache later on. If I close down the browser and start again and come back, the pages are still there. So I'll go over a few techniques that I use to, to, to make that to make that work. So starting with a with a, a network only strategy. Um, this is kind of the status quo. This is what happens if we don't do anything different. This is what a browser would normally do. It would say, okay, I've asked for, asked for a resource, go and fetch it. Uh, if the fetch from the network fails, then we can't do anything. We just, we just return an error. Um, so it might succeed if we're online, it might not. We can improve that a little bit by falling back to the cache. Um, so what we do is in this fetch, we add a, a, a catch block that will run a function if the fetch fails. And that looks a little bit like that. We're going to look in the cache now. Um, so if we couldn't get it from the network, we'll go to the cache. If we couldn't get it from the network or the cache, then we'll have an error. One more thing we need to do in there is get things into the cache in the first place. So what I've done now is to add a function that says if the network succeeds, go and, well, we're, we're going to return the response, but before then, put a copy of the response into the cache so that we can get to it later on. So now we have these two functions. And that's quite a nice improvement. It works quite well for offline. It works in this scenario when we're offline. But maybe we need to rethink a little bit about, about that because it, it's not always this clear cut as it turns out. So we've covered this scenario now. We've talked about a situation where we are definitely offline. There is no, um, no question about it. But we haven't really looked at some other scenarios. What about what about this when the that connection comes and goes, um, or this scenario when it's a very weak signal, or this scenario when we have some Wi-Fi that may or may not work? Um, that one didn't. Um, yeah, it turns out that yeah, browsing the web on, on a mobile device is often something like this. Yeah. So that's look familiar. So that did work, but you know, took a long time to get there. You could say it worked, you could say it doesn't. And, you know, even if it hadn't worked, it would have taken a long, equally long time to get to this. Um, we can't really do much about this because it's, it, it's sort of by design. It's, if we think about how the internet works, we have, we have TCP IP, it's, it's a reliable protocol, but it's built on top of this unreliable network. We've got all these physical connections, and um, none of which we can control. Um, and at any stage in there, something can go wrong. So when you, when you view a web page, the, the browser 
starts talking in HTTP and the the operating system will use the computer's hardware to send packets to a router. The router will send them on to another router and probably several others in between. Those packets then get sort of reassembled by a server which passes it back to a web server process running on that machine. So we've done all that to get the packets to ask the request. Then the whole lot has got to come all the way back. And only when it comes back, when the response comes back, do we get an answer. If something goes wrong, our packets are going out into space. We don't know where they're going, but they're not coming back. And all the browser can do in this, in this situation is, is sit there and wait. And it will hope that they come back, but it doesn't know. And it has to, it has to give an answer. So the only way it can do that is, is by waiting a while. And if it hasn't heard anything, by giving up. And that's the, that's the browser timeout that you get. So we can learn a couple of things from that. Firstly, that you know, it takes time to determine this online, offline state. Perhaps more importantly, that the users, that our users of our website may not wait for that timeout. They might decide before. You know, in that, in that video, is quite a long wait, and they could easily have just closed down the tab and thought, no, it's not happening. So maybe we need to rethink our strategy a little bit. That website from 2007 that I showed earlier is a fixed width. Nowadays, we don't assume that we don't write websites with fixed width. We don't assume that there is enough space for multi-column layout. So we change the way we do design. So that we design for mobile first, then we add layouts if we can. So what if we did the same thing for about network connectivity? What if we were assumed that we were offline first and then treated the, the presence of a network as an enhancement? If you think that sounds a little bit crazy, um, then think about the layout a few years ago. If you'd said to somebody then, actually, layout is an enhancement. It's not an intrinsic part of the site. It's an enhancement. They probably thought that was a bit crazy too. So we talked about caching pages. And if they're in our cache to start with, why don't we show them to the user while we wait? Here's an example from the, the uh, native Twitter app. Now when I fire that up, I see tweets straight away. You know the tweets that were there last time I used the app? And after, after a few seconds, um, I get this little bubble that pops up saying there's new tweets. So what happened there was that I saw the content, then the new content was fetched, and then I saw the notification. And crucially, I could, I could start reading those tweets, I could start interacting with them before the data arrived. What I wasn't doing was seeing a blank screen with a spinner saying, please wait while well, tweets are being loaded. And if, if the network had failed, I would just not have seen that bubble. And maybe I'd seen an, a message that says, sorry, no, you, know, um, you can't fetch new tweets. Um, that can't be helped. So you're not always going to be able to. You know, we can't do magic. We can't get something if there is no signal. So that's really the whole, the whole idea behind going offline first. We want to give the user something straight away, even if it's old. Um, worry about whether it's changed later, and we'll see whether it's changed, and then tell the user. Yeah. That is usually better. Not always. There are certain cases where you really don't want to give out stale content, um, maybe live sports scores. 
would be an example. But very often, someone would rather see something that's a little bit older, a bit out of date, and know that it is, than just see nothing. And if we really want to get a good user experience, we can um, try to try to decouple, try to separate out the user's interaction on their phone when the user presses something from these slow network requests that take a long time. So that when somebody presses a link, they get something straight away. Now in order to, to do that, we need to start by loading some things in advance. So let's look at that, um, that install event and see if we can add some code to, to handle that. And it's quite simple that all I need to do in here is, is really um, use that fetch API and that cache API and get some URLs and put them in the cache. And that means that you know, once I visit the website, those resources are, are downloaded now. They'll always be available going forward. The fetch handle is a little bit more interesting. So last time we, we added a fallback for when the network failed. We need to turn that on its head a bit. We need to go to the cache first and then fall back to the network. So it looks a little bit like this. Uh, we try the cache, that will give us back a, a response, or it may not give us back a response. If it does, we just give the user that. If it doesn't, we go and fetch it from the network, and we then put it, a copy of it into the cache as we did before. So I'm going to add one more little thing in here. Uh, if we did find something in the cache, then what I want to do is, is fetch another copy of it. So there's, there's no point leaving it in there because then we'll, we'll get stuck. We'll always show whatever page the user first downloaded. So I want to fetch it again. And then when that fetch comes back, I want to um, replace what was in the cache with my, my new updated content. But what's interesting here is this, this purple line that's highlighted. We're not waiting for that to finish. It will go straight on to the second line, which is return the cache response. And that gives us our kind of instant response. Um, the fetch is asynchronous. It will happen at some point after the user has seen the page. Now, this works, this works great for things like CSS, things like images. You know, it doesn't matter too much if I got the previous version. Uh, the next time I hit the page, I'll get an updated version. There's no, there's no real cost to doing this in terms of network requests. Um, yeah, I was going to make that network fetch anyway. I want to handle HTML content a little bit differently. Um, there's a slight risk that I will show the user. The user will open up their phone and see a page that was a bit old. Um, and I kind of want to have some way of telling them that. Um, and in that fetch handler, we get, we get two responses. We get the first one from the cache and the second one that comes down later on. And when that second fetch comes back, remember the user's already looking at a page. And if it is old, we need to tell them somehow. So we need to be able to compare those two pages um, if they're different, I want to tell the user that, hey, this page has changed. If they're the same, we just won't do anything. This is, this is uh, nice. We've, got, um, you know, we've kind of got away with it, as it were. We've given, um, given the user the page and told them it was, this is it. And then, thankfully, the page didn't change. But if it had changed, I need to send a message. Um, and the best way to do that is... Um, using this, this post message. So service workers can't communicate with the, the, with the DOM. Um, they sort of exist in, in um, it's a bit like having a separate thread. It's not, not completely like having a, a different thread, but um, 
you can't access the, the, the browser, the page. So I, I need to do this with this asynchronous messaging. And I'll post a message from my worker saying there's some updated content. And I'll tell it what URL has been changed. And then on my, my document side, I will listen for messages coming from the service worker. And then, and then um, put up something in the DOM accordingly. And the way that I had to get this to work was by putting in a, a, a um, sort of proxy in, in between that could use and um, could put in a header called etag. The etag is, is a hash of the actual content. So if any content changes, you'll get a different hash value. Um, and that's quite a nice way. You can look at the headers from the two, two responses and say, are they the same? Are they different? If I now look at my, uh, if I now go back to the to the demo site again, what I want to do is is carry on browsing through this site, and I'll I'll go down and find um, one page. And now the the browser is making a second request, and when that request comes back, it's changed, and I sent a message, and now I can handle it like this, and give the user the option to to to, to reload the page. Most of the time, that won't happen. Um, but it's, it's quite a nice way of, of dealing with it when it does. And they, yeah, a user won't be any the wiser if it didn't happen. They'll just think, oh, I got my content straight away. So I'll wrap up by talking about service workers in the context of something that people are calling progressive web apps. I mentioned the progressive enhancement. These things are kind of built on top of the web as it, as it already is. Um, we're not replacing anything here. We're just saying you have this extra functionality available. Um, we've talked a lot about, about the offline capability. But also, I can make a progressive web app installable. I can create a file. This is just a text file, a JSON file. Um, called a manifest, which um, will contain a few things like the name of of, of the site, the icon, um, various other things like the colour of the uh, toolbar at the top. And just by putting this in, um, certain browsers, namely Chrome on Android, will give you the option to put this on your home screen. But lastly, you know, I've said these are these are still linkable. The the building blocks of the web are URLs and links. And um, yeah, we've left that alone. Each one of those pages had a had a nice um, a nice URL that I could share or um, post on social media. And um, you know, I didn't have to go and download an app. Um, and then start again navigating within the app to get to where I was going to go. And if the if the browser didn't support um, service workers, I would just see the same page as I had before. Um, there's been a bit of work on this done in um, in in Drupal. Um, there's a, there's a module that is quite interesting. It attempts to um, automate building the service worker script. Um, it's it's very early. It's um, it's quite experimental. Um, I used it for the early part of the, the demo, and then I had to um, do a bit of extra stuff for um, the later one for the updates. But it's um, definitely something that I would say is worth keeping an eye on. And I'll just I'll leave you with um, a few resources that uh, I'd recommend that you, you take a look at. Um, the first one is, is uh, this talk, the notes from this talk, um, and that has all of the others. So um, 
if you if you, the first one is uh, yeah lists everything you want. Um, there's quite a few other videos from the um, especially from the the, the Google I/O conference. Um, they did a whole uh, series of sessions on this. Um, that's very useful. Um, I actually had to kind of listen to quite a few talks about service workers before uh, the, the penny dropped, so to speak. And um, uh, so, so it does. It does often take a few um, a few goes, as it were, to to, um, to, to understand this stuff. Thanks for, for listening. Uh, uh, um, just a couple of things. If I could ask you to, to evaluate the session that, um, and give some feedback, that would be very helpful. Um, also, we'll, there are contribution sprints on Friday. Um, and um, I'll happily answer questions if you could use that, that microphone so that the questions are recorded as well. That'd be great, thank you. With the um, service worker, can you have an event which triggers that um, reload process even after it's been reloaded once? So can you have content um, as it's being updated, kind of pop up that notification. Oh, so if the service worker was sort of, like if it was polling the, the Yeah, is the there a way to, um, when you update your content, let, let your users who are on that page know that it's been updated without reloading the page? Um, you, you might be able to, I think there's, there is, Something coming to do to do sort of service server push. Um, that's probably a little bit further away. Um, so I, I don't know anything. You could yeah you could poll it. Um, this is, yeah this is kind of. Yeah. 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 So you could. Uh, that was um, the point. Was I, th I think you can um, start with the network first, and I think you, you've maybe put a, a. You can have a race where you say, "I want the network to to go for." Um, a certain amount of time, and then if it doesn't come back within that time, uh, use the cache yeah. and do something like that. Do anything about the cache headers that you get from the server? I, I didn't get that you are taking that into account. You, you can get a cache expirations header on um, Apache or different servers. You, you can get, yeah, in the, um, in the uh, get request. When you do the get request, you get an, a cache expiration header. There are you, you can program that to have different kind of expiration headers. So depending on the kind of data, you could decide if you do something first, go to the cache because this expires in two years or go to whatever is online and, and then fall to the cache. Yeah, um, so the, the 
the thing with the cache headers is, um, or the, so the, the service worker kind of operates um, in the same way as a, a browser would. If it requests a page, and if you serve a page with a long expiration time, it will go into the, to the browser's cache. Um, if you fetch that from the service worker, it will get it out of the cache, even if you say network, um, because it has it in there for a certain amount of time. It knows it doesn't need to get it again. Um, so you still need to implement sort of cache headers in, in the same way that you would and say this, this content is valid for so long. Um, yeah, it, it can get a bit confusing. Um, I think the, probably the easiest way is to think that if, you, if you're serving up some content and you say this is valid for one hour, um, there could be any number of intermediate proxies um, between the server and the client, and each one of them could sort of hold on to the data for that time because that's what the server said. It said, you know, don't come back within this time. Um, if, yeah, I think if you think of it like that, then the sort of the, the last step of whether the service worker then asks the, the network for it, um, it doesn't necessarily need to know where it comes from. It just knows that I'm potentially making a, a request. I, th I think that's right. Uh, anyway, should I? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat it. That's fine. Yeah. Yes. Yes, but you need to test the, the service worker too. Ah, yes, so, uh, um, so you have to have a way of putting it on an up uh, Yes, um, I think you can in, in uh, browser dev tools, I think you can disable them. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.